All right. Welcome to Why Is This Good, a podcast by the Naples Writers Workshop. I'm Christine, and I'm here with John and Rob. Hey, guys. Hello. And this week is a story from Rob. Rob, tell us what you picked. This is To the Measures Fall by Richard Powers. And uh, I haven't read it before, but I like the author, so I gave it a shot. And you're going to read from the beginning? Yeah, I'm going to start from the top and do the first page or so. First read through. You are biking through the Cotswolds when you come across the thing. Spring of 63. 21 years old in your junior year abroad at University of York after a spring term green with Chaucer, Milton, Byron, and Swinburne. Remember Swinburne? You're one of a life newly devoted to words. Your recent change, of course, has crushed your father. He long hoped that you would follow through on that Kennedy-inspired dream of community service. You, who might have become a first-rate social worker. You, who might have done good things for the species, or at least for the old neighborhood. But life will be books for you from here on. Nothing has ever felt more preordained. Terms out, and it's time to see every square mile of this island. Bicycle clips, a blue guide, a transistor radio, and skin-hugging rain. Villages slip past on valley roads as twisty as the clauses in Henry James. The book turns up in a junk shop in an old Saxon market town, whose name you will remember as almost certainly having an M in it. Among the rusted baby buggies and ancient radios, you find old cooking magazines, books on fly tying and photography, late 50s spy novels with cardboard covers worn as soft is felt, the thing pops out at you, to the measures fall, by someone named Elton Wentworth. There's nothing else like it in the shop. It's a fat tome with rough cut pages and a deluxe tooled binding. The dust jacket has disappeared, but the front matter suggests that you will know all about Mr. Wentworth already. Born in 1888, the author of 12 previous books and the winner of awards too numerous to mention. The first line reads, a freak snow hit late that year, two weeks after the San Martins returned to the gravel pits near the South Dons. The next few paragraphs sketch out a hard-pressed town, Wonton on Wold, much like the one you are in, with the M in it. On page 3, the author reveals the date, 1913. On the last page, a village search party finds the body of a young amputee captain who served as the Somme lying in the bottom of said gravel pits. Only seven years have passed, but the lilting opening cadences have darkened into fragments from another world. So, this is, uh, it's really unusual. I think that first page gives you a really good sense of what the narrator, what her preoccupations lie. This is definitely a story about loving a book, but also kind of the way loving a particular book changes over time, and how that change over time is kind of helplessly influenced um, by other people, by the masses, and kind of lastly by the internet. I've read a couple of things by Powers, and there's no one really quite like him. He's usually generally does kind of speculative, kind of leans into sci-fi, very contemporary stuff. Kind of a first-rate stylist, really interesting sentences, beautifully written, not really florid, kind of, I guess, appropriately kind of steely and kind of chromey. Those are kind of the words that pop out at me when I read his stuff. So I'm just kind of curious to throw it to Christine and John, what you guys thought of this. I love this story. This is probably one of my favorites that we've read for this. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, I think about this story, like, um, you hear the, the the advice, you know, to know your audience when you write, to think about your audience. And, and then sometimes the advice is write for yourself. But I think uh, in this story, story i am the audience for this story. <laughs> yeah, in some way this touched everything like every every part of this was this was so good i love this story were you familiar with like the book itself no i i'd never no okay. i mean i think the book is not it doesn't exist yeah i don't yeah. think the book exists okay. but everything else that does exist is stuff that I'm familiar with. I mean, the travel through history like hits all the right notes for my interest in history. The literary tradition that's kind of touched on, it's like all things that I'm familiar with and have encountered. And uh, it is so many levels on which this is, uh, which I am the audience for this story. I just really liked it. I thought I had looked up whether that book exists, but now I feel silly. But it makes sense that he would have made up something then to be able to give this book such elasticity through all these years, right? He doesn't ever really tell us what it's about. He just introduces all these weird subplots. And it's like, how is all that packed in there? I liked the part, and it starts a little after what Rob uh, read, but it starts at the very beginning. It carries throughout. It has this feel of the choose-your-own-adventure novel where there's not the real option. But um, at various points, it's in bold, and it says, what percentage of your of your pleasure has gone out of the book forever? Fractions permitted. It's like prompting you to, to answer. It's like a pause. So I like that because it gave you the sense, okay, it's written in second person. So it's you, 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 it's you. second you. person and present tense, yeah. which is interesting, yeah. So I love stories that are written that way. And when they're written that way, I think whether or not you realize it, you begin reading it in a way that feels like, okay, so this also reminded me of the one story that we read where the woman was talking about writing. She's like, you choose a, write, a life of writing. She's like, in, uh, did we read it in our workshop or on the podcast? She's like- We read it here, yeah. Okay, she's like, you're in college. You 
you oh, major in this. And then, there was a little yeah. more, yeah. She's like, you major in this and you major in that. When it's written in that way and it's talking about like major sweeping life decisions and by the time you realize that this is going to carry through a long portion of the character's life, it carries all the way to the end where she's dying in bed and, and thinking of this book. You get the sense that you're going to be told what happens in your life as the you or what happens in the character's life in its entirety. But then when the author introduced these bolded points where it teases you, it says, what would you have done in this scenario? What would you do now? You're reading it in hindsight because you know that the story continues without your input, right? I can't talk to this author. But it kind of lends itself to, I don't know, if you thought about your own way, your own life this way, all the points at which you could have opted to do something else, right? She she could have sold this book. She, she could have bought it for less. She could have not started the book club that ultimately discusses this and changes the way she thinks about it again. There's this weird sadness to it, right? There's nothing that you could have done. Um, this book has taken on a life of its own. It's affecting you in ways you can't control. And that lended such like a powerful tone to all of this for me. I was going to bring in, I, I thought I had it on my shelf, but I have too many bookshelves. I couldn't find it. This Choose Your Own Adventure book. Yeah. From like, Goosebumps. I read a bunch of those in the 80s and I, I thought I had one left over from that time, but I, I couldn't find it. But this is like Choose Your Own Adventure without the real choice, <laughs> right? Choose, yeah. yeah. But um, I felt like those little things kind of were kind of confrontations. The author would say, here, think about the character. Yeah. Right? Like, uh, does the book go to Goodwill? Like, uh, after she graduates, after the character graduates, you graduate in the spring, etc. And, oh, I'm sorry, you graduate in the spring and pack up your worldly possessions again. And then the, after that paragraph, uh, it asks the question, does the book go to Goodwill, the Salvation Army, or the 25 cent pile at your graduation lawn sale? And I think um, if, you, if you're reading, if you're paying attention as you're reading, you stop and you say, what would she do? You're not necessarily, you're not asking what you would do, but you're asking what she would do. And so it's a rhetorical in that way. It's, it lets you think about who is this? Would she actually give it to Goodwill? Would she sell it? I can see her selling. Like then you can imagine a scene where she's trying to sell it, but then somebody walks by and she's like, "Never mind, I can't do that," or something like that. And then a couple of lines later, um, it's a shock to come across that deluxe binding, which you distinctly remember throwing out a long time ago. Is a kind of a reflection on that moment mm-hmm. of like, did she give it away? Did she throw it out? She actually kept it and didn't remember keeping it. Anyway, that's that was my thought of that. These little moments or refl- moments reflect on the character's feelings. There are moments to reflect on the character's feelings, but also they're written from the perspective of knowing that a lot of times the answer was none of the above. So yeah, she, exactly. she doesn't get rid of it. Exactly. But in hindsight, the author is like, this is a turning point. And she continues with the book. And this was a turning point. And she continues with the book. I f- it felt like Bilbo Baggins in the ring, man. Like <laughs> she can't get rid of it. Yeah, that's right. It feels haunted in a way. Like it's taken on a life of its own that's really has power over her life. Life. She's just thinking about it on her deathbed. Yeah, she really signed up for it. I don't think she understood what she, <laughs> what she was buying initially. It seems like it's also a story about, and this story wraps it up nicely at the end, and I kind of, I don't want to read it for whoever's listening because it's really beautiful and it, it would kind of give away, but I'll mm-hmm. give away a little bit. Mm-hmm. Where it, you see someone who's, she, we start the story with a 21-year-old kid and she's kind of ditched what her dad wanted her to do and she's kind of, her, she's found her identity, but her identity shifts so much based upon how she feels about this book that these invasive little bold headers just kind of speak to the futility of it. I think John used a good word where they're aggressive and they're almost kind of um, patronizing and mocking too. And the the tone of them kind of kind of increase, increases along with that as well. And I think when we kind of get toward the end of the story, we're seeing that with so many shifts in what she thinks of the book and what other people think of the book and how it has, it comes into fashion. And then immediately as it comes into fashion, it recedes almost as drastically like kind of a, a tide going out or a riptide. It's that when we, I think maybe what Powers is getting at is that like when we sort of rely on something else to kind of define who we are what you get is the internet what you get is kind of mass culture what you get is these things that shift so quickly that's like well you're kind of missing the whole point the whole point is that things are always changing so to kind of stamp yourself down and be like now I've dedicated myself to this well just by doing that you're, you're immediately saying tomorrow I'm going to be rededicated to something else so it's it's kind of a sad book It's it, there is a sadness to the story but it's offset kind of brilliantly by these weird headers that are just kind of like toying with you 
And it, it sounds like the author, but it sounds like a, I can't really place what, how I would describe whose tone it is. It seems too remote to be another author. It almost seems like it's the internet talking back at, at the story in a way, because we do kind of end in the, in the internet world where it's, it kind of has that like top five lists of things you can do. It's almost like the internet is this sentient thing now. And it's sort of talking back to the, the one, the kind of the defining motivation that started with was just like this reliance to define ourselves on stuff, on our book, on whatever, on being a Kennedy community servant. Pause for station identification. <laughs> well, this one, I don't know. This one was hard for me. Like, I don't know. I think Rob probably described it just now, but I didn't necessarily get it originally. The idea that, like, you shouldn't base too much of your own worth on something like this, right? But even if you do, it's almost unavoidable. I don't even right, know if it's a it's, sure thing. It's like, this is going to happen. She seems surprised over and over each right. time she has a different reading. Yeah. That's but, the thing. Yeah. I mean, it, it kind of feels to me like that story, Goodbye and Good Luck, that we read uh -huh. a couple episodes ago. Who wrote that? Grace Paley. Grace Paley, that's yeah. right. Because it's a lifetime relationship, right? It's a returning lover oh, over and over, right. over again. Yeah. yeah, that's a great parallel. It feels like the beginning of the story almost feels like, here's how I met the love of my life, Yeah. right? And then these are the ups and downs through my through our life together. And then on the deathbed, it's like we're, we're holding hands. Right. Right? So. And you're not letting go either. It's like, she yeah. refuses to like let go of this book. Yeah. Right. It's interesting if this wasn't a book and it if it were less of a symbolic item or an item that couldn't talk back to you, like that didn't have any words on it. Like if this was a keepsake of sorts to write an entire story about a woman that holds on to something like this throughout her throughout her life. And then what's interesting is to Rob's point that you can't read it the same way after your life changes as drastically as it does. It's it's going to be this thing that takes on its own life over and over and over. It's not just like, I don't know, your mother's wedding band or something. And this was such a noisy story too. I found it like almost like too loud, not too loud, but but too loud. It's like the it kind of ramps up the volume too. It's just when you're kind of on the internet for a while, you get that feeling where you're just like enough, like the just the, the volume of it is, is so intense. And just when we're talking about, again, to give more details of the story, when we're we're getting into like the nuts and bolts of how the world perceives Wentworth as he comes back into fashion. It's just like, it's insane how everyone has an opinion and it's way too much. And it's just, you see this, like this lady's been multiplied a billion times. Ugh. Yeah, she seems like, I don't know. Well, she's you, right? Yeah. She's you and she's me. It's like, get a grip. You don't you don't got to worry about this thing so much. She seems so stuck on it. I don't know. Well, it's such a, it's also a story about, you You get so stuck on it because she is, it's immediately about assigning value to it. Like, how much should I pay mm -hmm. for this? How much, is it worth this? Did Winston Churchill sign it? No, mm -hmm. some like goober, like redneck who was his <laughs> book. But also she's a writer. So she's one of these people that maybe is looking for meaning in place. Yeah. I don't know. I identified with her that way, right? Like books are sacred objects. Did I understand it fully? Was it worth this much? Should I get rid of it? Definitely not. That I identified with. Yeah, it's the total futility of assigning value to something that is just open for interpretation. But it's futility, but it's not shaking a finger at you either because it's, again, you're, it's you are the Y-O-U. You're the narrator. Or you're not the narrator. That's the point of view. You're the reader. You're the character. You're the character. We, we talked about this in our last episode, which no one will ever hear. We can hint at it forever. But uh, <laughs> I think uh, you know when you when you're confronted with the you as a character, and um, the Lori Moore story was different because she wrote in what she called that um, mock imperative self improvement uh -huh. right. style. This is more of a narrative with the character as you, more like the choose your own adventure. You go into the house, you go up to the door, do you knock or do you open it, and then you turn to page three or turn to page sixteen or whatever it is. In this one, there's no choices, but the character is more. I want to say is more it's more of a narrative like i said but what happens when you read it and i think this is true of any character is you supply most of the character and what happens mm -hmm. is you th this is how you think of other people too is usually when when you're thinking of another person and how they might behave you're like okay what would my friend do if this happened to them most of your idea of your friend is what you would do and then you adjust that according <laughs> to what you know about your friend yeah like i really like pancakes but my friend doesn't so he probably wouldn't eat the pancakes. <laughs> Or whatever it is. And I think that's the same thing that happens in fiction is when you meet a character, you're like, okay, even if it's third person, Sally woke up in the morning. It's like, okay, I wake up in the morning. Sally got out of bed. You know, I get out of bed. Sally stumbled over her clothes. Oh, I've never done that. Okay, Sally is different for oh, me yeah. in that way. <laughs> <laughs> 
But the same thing happens with a you character. Is like, and and I love the way that um, what was that line? Yeah, you are by the way female. Right? Yeah, this this little the by the way in there, and um, you are by the way female is such a kind of a authorial winking. Maybe maybe not. Maybe that's the wrong way to think of it. But uh, that's what it felt like. Yeah, it's like he knew he was playing this game with us. And it's like, oh, by the way, half of you, are half less, of you less assumed than half of you. based on my sex. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that my main character was also male. But you know, things like that kind of force you to reconfigure the character in your head and you reconfigure and it drifts farther and farther away from who you are and becomes its own kind of separate character that you can hold in your mind and understand in that way. Yeah, that's a great point. And the book itself sounds kind of boring. It sounds like ridiculous. Yeah. It sounds like this one this guy wanted to go out with one book. He's like, I got one shot. I better cram everything in it. Yeah. The way that she feels it all. And to think that the world puts that much importance on it for however brief a time. Turns out he wrote it in the 20s, but it didn't get published until after the war. <laughs> Well, what would you guys take away from this one? Or is there anything else you wanted to point out first? There's something I kind of want to point out, but it, it leads sure. into my takeaway. So I'll do that. So there's, I want to go through a couple of lines. Like I said, I really love this story. And a lot of it was the lines. So the character is a, she went through graduate school to be like a literary critic, to study literature. There's a great um, notion there. Um, like having, you know, I did the same thing. I, I went to graduate school for literature. <laughs> um, my master's was in English literature. My PhD was in a comparative study program, so it's slightly different. But I read the history of, of literary criticism and, you know, took many, a lot of, basically, it's embossed in my mind how that turned. But there's a great line where she says, uh, or where the narration says, uh, psychoanalysis is so seven years ago. I forget the exact point, but in the post-structural thing makes you queasy or something, or gives you hives. I don't remember what the yeah, line hives. was. <laughs> but uh, so she, she is this person who wants to be a literary critic, wants to devote herself to studying literature but doesn't write her dissertation and winds up going to law school. So she's embedded in this this literary world. And so all these so when when things are being described, um, they borrow from literature. It's very T. S. Eliot literary tradition kind of things. So my uh, my lines. You stop to fix dinner for your husband who, an invalid of high modernism, cannot fix it for himself. <laughs> it's like I love that line, you know, because it speaks to a certain attitude in uh, in the study of, of literature. Or the modernism and, and stuff like that. Um, even even more more subtle things like or not subtle things, but even more um, run of the mill things. You make your husband read it. Speaking of the book, you make your husband read it. You do the Lysistrata thing until he does. You know the the whole story there is contained in the Aristophanes play. Uh, if you know it, then it, it, it's the the situation is great. Uh, so that's that's a description. The um, and then um, a few pages later, talking about her daughter, your daughter, glaze eyed and body snatched, chance read, mommy read like she's off and Neverland already, even before the first verb. Um, and this line, and you, fallen Wendy, eviscerated by the eternal recurrence of it all, hear Peter snarl at you for growing guilty and big and old. And this is the point at which I wrote, God, I love this story in the margin. <laughs> All these literary, I don't want to call them illusions because they're not quite alluding to things. They're pulling from literature. They're kind of pulling all of literature into the story and kind of using it as a uh, canvas on which to, to paint these pictures. So my takeaway is you see a lot of times in some fictions, I, I see writers who will find a great kind of turn of phrase or metaphor to describe something that isn't necessarily out of the cloth of the story. And whereas most of the, everything that I'm pulling out of here, the the way in which things are described, the uh, metaphors, the um, allusions, the descriptions, all pull from that, the background of the character and pull from what the character is familiar with and who the character is. And it all serves to kind of build up this overall feeling. And I think if, if you can do that in your in your fiction where you, you don't reach for a metaphor that's outside of the story, but you stay inside the story, I think it can make the story that much stronger and more cohesive. And I really like that about this story. So that was my takeaway. Christine? Um, my takeaway has nothing to do with the way this is written, but um, I wonder if you guys reread books. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Okay, I don't usually, but when I was younger, I remember I visited my mom, my grandparents' house, and there was a book on the shelf that belonged to my aunt, and I was a kid that judged books by its cover, and this one was hideous, but I was like, I gotta read this, and it was this massive chapter book, and I was in sixth grade, and it was called Dinner at the Homesick Restaurant by Ann Tyler. It was like so above my head. Ann Tyler? Yeah, and I read this thing, and I was 
was like, oh, I love it. This was beautiful. Wow, wow, wow. And I'm 12. And I obviously had like no clue what I was talking about. But I ended up reading it again when I was a senior in high school and I wrote my thesis on it, this end of the year thing. And I was blown away that I could find like literary criticism on this book and obviously had like a totally different takeaway from it. And there's a main character in the book named Ezra. And to this day, like I name all of my main characters Ezra. Like I, I can't help it. But my point is that like that's one of those books I can like point to and say, I obviously had a much different reading. And I know if I read it again, I would have a much different reading. The only other thing I have like the patience to do this with is like Harry Potter. And then as a journalist, I read a lot of journalism over and over. And one of the things I've been doing for the past like five years or so is um, reading 9-11 stories. Like on 9-11 every year, I'll read like the same handful of 9-11 fiction or not fiction, but journalism pieces, usually long form, not stuff that was written that day, but stuff that was like written after the fact. And one of them's uh, The Falling Man. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah. So I learned something new every time. And sometimes it's something profound, like what this book, what this short story is talking about, right? Like I interpreted it a different way because it's something different that's happened to me in the past year, or I just have a better appreciation for 9-11 itself, whatever it is. Usually I'm learning something about the way it was written. And if you have the patience to do that in a really deliberate way, it pays off. It's crazy how just reread a short story, reread your favorite one. I guarantee you, you don't remember all of it. You don't even remember it the right way and reread it again you'll learn something so I get the preoccupation for this this main character because she's struggling to understand this right at first she doesn't understand it which is why she revisits it but like revisit something you think you totally nailed like my when I was in sixth grade I was like dinner at the homesick restaurant got it brilliant <laughs> and then like I reread it and obviously I was totally wrong that's my that's my takeaway yeah, I'd like good. to it seems like it's easy to introduce a conflict for your character and then just have them try to solve it but I don't see a lot of the conflict it's kind of getting worse and worse and worse and louder and louder. <laughs> and this one seemed to be really snowballing pretty continually where she keeps getting the initial problem where, if not the initial problem, but kind of the initial event where she ditches the Kennedy-inspired dream and then goes for the books. And then it just kind of keeps going. And then where, where she ends up is death, her deathbed. <laughs> and so you don't, even, you don't always have to end up there. But I think it's just a fun thing or at least a challenge to say, okay, you introduce a character, you have a, your inciting incident or your conflict. How much bigger can you make it? And by making it that much bigger, you're going to learn that much more about your character. So I would like to see more of that out of me. Yeah, they always, I feel like they always talk about that advice, like when they talk about it in terms of really plot heavy stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Like if John's writing his his adventure novel, like the character can't just finish his journey in a straight line. Yeah. It's got to become more complicated. You have to raise the stakes. But in a story like this, it's really interesting when the problem's in her head and then you're really forced to like delve into your character harder. Yeah. yeah, and it's great. You feel like you know this person inside and out, or at least you know her obsession and that seems to define her pretty well for the narrator. Awesome. Thanks guys. Thanks.